Next question. Is there any evolutionary advantage to not fitting in to where you were born? Uh, and then he says, parentheses, for instance, having wanderlust. Hmm. Those are two different questions. I think so too. Yeah. 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 yeah the, the, it's, there's a parenthetical with IE and I think now it's, it's different, uh, diff two different questions. Yeah. So the wanderlust one is easy, right? All of us are descended from people who found some place that wasn't known before, who had some version of wanderlust, you yep. know, in general. And yep. so, and so, some, most adventurers fail, um, but we are all the descendants of some successful adventurer explorer. Yeah, it's it's an expected value calculation. The mm -hmm. fact that you know ninety nine in a hundred such people may fail and leave no descendants, if you know the one leaves, you know. 10,000 times as many uh, great, great, great grand offspring as they otherwise would have because they found a new continent. I think we ended up taking almost all the salmon stuff out of the book, um, much to my chagrin. Um, but you know, you, you for many, many years, and then we wrote into the book this, this discussion of what, you know, the Oncorhynchus, the Pacific, the genus of Pacific salmon, <clears throat> that includes coho and, and sockeye and silver salmon and silver, yeah, pink, king. Um, or anadromous and, um, and semiparous. So anadromous meaning they are born in freshwater. They go out to the oceans as, as very young fish and they spend their adulthood there. And then they return to their natal streams, uh, in order to reproduce. And semiparous means they, they mate once and die. Uh, and so at the point that they are actually returning to their natal streams, uh, as they transition from the saltwater back to the freshwater, they're, they're, anatomy and physiology changes so that they can make this last journey, but they actually stop eating and they basically start digesting themselves. Uh, so these you know, very extraordinary fish that we have, you know, that are all over the Pacific Rim, I think. Yeah. Um, but definitely, you know, the Pacific Northwest and, you know, very few now down in California because we've just, we've destroyed the rivers. Um, but, you know, what, what you have talked about a, a lot is, you know, how, how is it that, um, there isn't just one river with salmon in it, well, right? Yeah. Like how you know how how is it that you know as as, as extraordinary as semel parity is, that is to say, mating once and then dying, as opposed to itero parity, in which you have more opportunities for reproductive success later on, which is true for the vast majority of of species, including us, of course. Regardless of whether or not you actually only do it once, we are an itero parous species, and anadromy, this ability to move from freshwater into saltwater and being mandated there and then moving back, um, really complex metabolic and physiologically, um, but you know, even more just as extraordinary, I would say, is how do they diversify? Given that, if you go up the wrong stream and you're the only one who did so, then you're guaranteed to have been a genetic dead end. You didn't, you know, you don't run into any of your kind because you went up some wrong stream. So, so what we have is uh, animals that make what we wrongly understand to be mistakes in both space and time. Right, a certain number of fish end up in the wrong uh, watershed. Hey, Zach. Um, and a certain number of fish end up at the wrong watershed, and a certain number of fish come back a year early. And the point is that means that if you imagine that there's an undiscovered watershed, right, one that has no salmon in it but that could support them, it gets discovered. If a watershed has lost a salmon run, um, due to you know, landslide or something like that, then it gets recolonized. And so the point is, it's always it's always been a logical error to regard these as mistakes rather than gambles, right? Yeah, that's, that's the exactly salmon it. that gamble on uh, the wrong gear or the wrong watershed um, has a very high likelihood of failure and a very low chance of a very extreme payoff. Um, so anyway, yeah. And then, so anyway, that's the wanderlust part of the question. Yeah. And then the other part of the question. Is there any evolutionary advantage to not fitting into where you were born? Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, of course, it's funny, yeah. you know, of course we went to, Sam, uh, I did, went to salmon and anadromy, and that's an obvious way to split up these two questions. They could be the same thing, but they aren't inherently. And certainly if you're salmon, they're not the same thing. <laughs> right. No. I would just say there, there even there are even two questions in your not fitting in component mm -hmm. here. One is does selection generate people who don't fit in because it makes sense to have such people? Yeah. And I would say actually left-handedness. 
I, that's exactly where I was going to go. Yep. Is is one of these. We know yes. this is not an accident. This is something at low but not zero frequency. And there's R- a, roughly 10% across all cultures. Right. right. And uh, we can make arguments. And for, that number stands, unlike the number for homosexuality, which has been invoked for so many decades. Y- well, let's put it this way there is a frequency of homosexuality that appears to be. Uh, not stable, but there's always some frequency. And so- No, I, I, ab- absolutely. I was going to say 100%. That's just going to be confusing. But yeah. um, that 10% number has been trotted out for decades as like, yep, left lefties are about 10% of every population, every culture known, and homosexuals are about 10%. And the number for homosexuals, it seems, is, is probably a lot lower than that. Al- yep. Always present, but lower, whereas left-handedness um, seems to show up at about 10% um, across cultures, in cultures that don't mind it, in cultures that uh, demonize it, you know, just regardless, it's it, it shows up. Right. So anyway, I would argue both of these things are instance, oh, also colorblindness. All of these things are mm-hmm. uh, probably understood best at lineage level, right? Where the idea is you, 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 it's not that the left-hander is at advantage. It's that the lineage that contains the left-handers, the lineage that contains gay people, the lineage that contains colorblind people at some rate has an advantage over a lineage that simply doesn't. So mm-hmm. th- those would be simple cases. Then there's the other case, which is what happens if normal is disrupted by something in your developmental environment? Is there an advantage to uh, the kind of misfit that you become when your developmental environment just uh, went haywire or something was off, right? And I would argue that this too, that basically there is a contingency program or a set of contingency programs that takes, frankly, many of the people that we revere, right, are built of this stuff. They had some experience that yeah. caused them not to see things in exactly the same way as the people who had the more normal uh, deve- developmental period. And then the point is actually they're in a really good position to see things that we can't see. And they tell us these things and it becomes, you know, it's passed on in, you know, in art or something mm-hmm. or, you know, obviously you could divide that up much more finely. Sure. But, um, but basically they have insight that comes from having traversed some other route to get here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yes, uh, uh Selection very rarely gives up on creatures. It's not wired to do that because it always makes sense to the extent you've got a creature. What's the most you can make of this? And sometimes what you make of it is uh, very positive. Very good. Next question. Did evolution select for delusion over scientific honesty because of the resulting strength of will and its advantages for survival and or domination? Thank you both. Stay the course. Um, yeah, it definitely selects for delusion for many reasons. Um, you could argue that self-deception is delusion for the purpose of misleading others, right? Mislead yourself first and then mislead others. As Bob Trivers has explicitly argued. Yep. Uh, you could argue that long odds could be very demoralizing and that actually this goes right back to the question of explorers, Mm -hmm. um, if you know, if somebody was there to explain to a salmon, do you realize how unlikely it is that you're going to find a river that doesn't have any salmon in it, and that there will be somebody there for you to mate with, and that you're going to have lots and lots of offspring? More than and if you, the salmon had enough receptive language to understand what was being told, it would to really him. have to understand more than your average salmon. But sure. um, but anyway, the point is, uh, what causes you know that I, was too much. Tess was like, I, "I'm out of here." He, Talking salmon, no, really he's looking for an empty watershed, but. Um, But, you know, I've made the argument with respect to people who, in the age of exploration, used to get onto ships and sail over the horizon. Yeah. Sailing over the horizon is a very perilous business, right? So if the expected value of sailing over the horizon is positive, because who knows, you might find a continent nobody knows about, right? But the chances that you as an individual are going to do anything other than, you know, suffer from scurvy because the oranges have run out on the ship or whatever. Yeah, die a scurvy death out at sea. Right. Mm-hmm. You're, you're very likely to die an unpleasant death if your choice is, hey, you know, I wonder what's over that horizon. Um, but the point is you should be, because expected value is what selection is going to care about, you should be inclined to do it. Then the point is maybe the story you tell yourself is, you know, I feel lucky about going over that horizon. Mm-hmm. I think I think this might work out. You know, 
yeah, I got a good feeling about this, right? I got a good feeling about this might be bullshit most of the time. Um, but the point is the person who does find the continent that nobody knows about probably said it. And actually, you know what? I have a great example for this. Yeah. So the, you know, the Beringians were doing that as they were heading east from Asia uh, and ultimately into discovering the new world. I right. got a good feeling about this and they didn't have to risk scurvy in the same way that people on ships did. Although I'm honestly not sure what they did about vitamin C. Right. Lichen? I don't know. I don't know what they were eating that got them the vitamin C. I, I don't know. It may, it may be uh, contained in certain kinds of fish meat of some kind. But oh. anyway, um, the example I wanted to use, I, I've always wanted to run an experiment where we test to see what fraction of uh, lottery winners have a system for picking numbers. My guess is the answer would be very high. Right, not because a system works, but because if you believe that you have a system, you're likely to buy lottery tickets because you think actually mm -hmm. I have a good feeling about this. Yeah. Um, so the belief is correlated with buying a lot of lottery tickets, and buying a lot of lottery tickets is correlated with having a greater chance of winning. Right, a greater chance, which yeah. is still the expected value is negative in that case, right. but um, nonetheless, from the point of view of who will have beaten the odds and right. won the lottery, it will be people who thought. They had a good chance of winning the lottery and turn out to have been right for the wrong reasons. 